my name is Paul Ayres, I'm Director of Library Services here at UCL, University College in uh, London, and also Chair of the Larry Chief Information Officer Community. And what I've been asked to talk about today is um, a, an overview of open access challenges and opportunities here in the UK in 2015. And these are the areas that I've chosen to uh, talk about. So four main areas that I want to try and analyse in some detail to show the challenges and the weaknesses of the UK uh, position in terms of what we're doing in the open access world. I'm going to talk about the different approaches to national policy that you will find here in uh, the UK. Then look at how that translates into funding streams that are coming in to support the activity that university researchers are undertaking. Uh, I'm going to have to say something about the dreaded um, area of double dipping, double payments for uh, publications. And then in the final section I'm going to take those national issues and try and reflect them in a, a particular institutional example. That is UCL, my own university here in central London, and what we're doing to promote and advocate uh, 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 open access approaches to uh, research outputs. So let's start with the, the first of those and, and, and take a look at the different uh, approaches to open access policy that various stakeholders in the UK have, have, have taken. Uh, and we'll start with the, uh, the first uh, stakeholder in the sense that they were the earliest to develop uh, an open access policy uh, position, because as will become quickly obvious uh, from my talk, we don't have one UK policy position on open access. We have a number of different approaches to how we deal with uh, open access, and that's part of the challenge in a UK context. So the Wellcome Trust is, is the largest funder of biomedical uh, research anywhere in Europe, and UCL is a very happy recipient of a significant amount of Wellcome Trust funding, some of which is used to pay for gold uh, OA for, their, uh, for the uh, funded outputs uh, from researchers who are funded by the uh, Wellcome Trust. Uh, and as you see here, what the Wellcome Trust will do, and a number of associated uh, uh, charities, uh, known collectively as uh, COAT, but, but largely uh, the, the biggest single um, slice of money comes from the, the Wellcome Trust. They will provide uh, a single block grant to a number of research intensive universities, uh, UCLA is fortunate to be one of those, uh, and will therefore pay for gold uh, APCs, article processing charges, for those funded uh, research outputs. Uh, research Councils UK is another major uh, UK uh, research funder. Uh, they have a policy, uh, and their follows, uh, policy uh, follows the Finch Report, which was a government-endorsed uh, 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 report which sees the future of scholarly communication in the UK as being an open access future, uh, and not simply open access, but goal OA. Uh, and so the UK is one of the few uh, uh, countries in the world, actually, that favours gold OA, gold open access, as the preferred model for uh, furthering OA policy uh, and implementation. What RC UK uh, will do, Research Councils UK, they will, like the welcome, play, uh, pay uh, block grants to universities for set proportions of the uh, funded research outputs that they uh, uh, fund as part of their research uh, funding. Uh, and uh, it applies to journal articles and uh, conference proceedings, but not yet uh, monographs. So research monographs are exempt from the open access uh, uh, requirement. And there is another uh, requirement by RC UK that all these research outputs uh, need to have a CC BY license attached, an attribution license, the most liberal of all the CC BY family of uh, licenses. And these are conditions for getting the funding to uh, fund the, the OA payments. Uh, 
Research Council's UK, their policy has recently been reviewed by an independent uh, review body. I was a member of that uh, review body. Uh, and these are some of the points that the review body uh, found when we were uh, looking at the implementation of the policy in, in the first year. Uh, and I give you the URL for the full text of that review report uh, if you're interested in, in, in reading it. So the review questions, as I'm questioning here today, whether in fact the UK does have anything like a national open access uh, policy, which academics and researchers who have to comply uh, with funding requirements actually understand. And I'm suggesting actually that the position of the UK is rather confused. We don't have one uh, UK policy, we have a number of policy approaches to open access, which are mutually uh, compatible, because each has separate requirements for different sorts of outputs. And I'll come and talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in uh, a minute. Uh, the RCUK review, we found that actually universities find it quite difficult to account for how they were spending the money that RCUK had given them in uh, year one for uh, APC payments. So there's an issue there about monitoring and uh, reporting that universities will have to uh, look at. They were faced very suddenly with a requirement to spend the money in a number of very granular payments for APC payments and accounting uh, and reporting that level of activity is actually quite a challenge uh, for libraries, because uh, it's mainly university libraries that are managing these payments. Uh, that's quite a big challenge for libraries to, uh, uh, to deal with. We found when we talked to authors in the review panel that many were not very happy with the CC BY license. Uh, in STEM subjects, that science, technology and medicine, that was fine. Actually, they, they were fairly relaxed about this rather liberal attribution license which uh, RCUK was asking to be placed on the outputs. Not so for arts, humanities and social sciences. They were particularly, actually quite outspoken in their uh, unhappiness about having to assign a CC BY license to any funded uh, research. They wanted something much more restrictive, um, a CC BY MC, uh, MD, uh, SA, share alike, no, 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 no derivatives. Uh, it's something that would tie down the output much more than a, just a generic CC BY license would do. And I think the review didn't manage to resolve that uh, conflict between different subject areas, uh, and has recommended that that's an area for further uh, study. So there are a number of challenges, uh, things that we didn't get right in the first year of implementing the RCUK policy that this, uh, this report actually uh, describes in some detail. There is another player uh, on the block, uh, and this is the uh, National Research Evaluation Programme that we run here in the UK by our funding body, HEFKI the Higher Education Funding Council for England. Uh, the outcome of this um, evaluation, uh, which uh, happens every six years, uh, dictates an enormous amount of uh, research funding that comes into universities. And universities absolutely must uh, perform as well as they can within uh, the research evaluation uh, framework in order to uh, qualify for the funding that is awarded on the basis of the quality of the research outputs that all their uh, submitted authors are, are, are making. The next research evaluation framework uh, is in 2020, so uh, some time to go, but we're already planning, HEFKI's already set out the conditions for that research evaluation uh, program and universities like my own are already planning how they're going to comply with the requirements. Uh, and this um, a, a policy, the HEFKI 2020 policy, sets a new set of conditions which aren't reflected in any of the other funders' uh, conditions that I've talked about um, earlier today. So uh, RCUK and Wellcome are not uh, making exactly the same points that the HEFKI policy is making in a number of details. Because Hefke uh, is saying that an author uh, must deposit their manuscript within uh, three months of it being accepted by the publisher. And this deposit has to be in, preferably in an institutional repository, so your local repository, or, or a subject-based repository. But they're very strict that, the, uh, that 
deposit has to take place within three months of manuscript being accepted. Now, deposit in the UK, as it happens in most other countries around the world, normally takes place after publication, when you have a full set of metadata from the publisher to accompany the article, and it's easier to deposit an index in your repository when you have the full uh, set of, of metadata. Deposit on uh, acceptance by the publisher means that you're going to have to create a lot of local uh, metadata because it won't come with publisher metadata because the article hasn't been published. The author is going to have to remember to, uh, to uh, deposit the article within three months of uh, acceptance and the library, because uh, the library is usually the library that runs the repository, the library won't know when the article has been accepted. There's no workflow in place which informs the library when an article is uh, accepted. We usually get to know about it when it's been published. So that represents an, a really fundamental challenge for libraries in actually monitoring and implementing these um, HEPCI uh, 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 requirements. Uh, in other respects, the HEPCI policy is similar to that of RCUK. It, 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 it also applies only to journal articles and conference proceedings. Um, they will uh, respect embargo periods set by publishers in terms of making your, your output open access. Uh, and there are some uh, exceptions. So monographs, for example, are not covered by the HEFCI requirement as uh, similar actually to the RC UK uh, um, position. So we have a number of different policies. Uh, you might think they're confusing now in the way that I described them. You'd be an academic though uh, and a researcher who really only wants to do research rather than spend a lot of time reading through a number of different policies depending on how they're funded, and you imagine how they feel. They feel uh, extremely confused uh, and not a little bit irritated that we don't have one OA policy position and framework for implementation within the UK. So, that, so that's a real challenge for us in universities. How we work with academics to overcome their confusion, to uh, support them as they're trying to you know, do their day job and meet the requirements of a number of different funders uh, for OA uh, dissemination. L let's move on to the second area of the talk then and, and talk a little bit more in a bit more detail about the, the funding that libraries and researchers get to support OA. And I'm going to do this in, in a couple of ways. I'm, I'm going to look at how some research funders pay uh, universities, give uh, money to universities and their researchers to publish uh, in OA, so it's gold uh, OA. Uh, and then I'm going to look a bit at the cost of how, uh, how much it costs to implement the OA policy in, in uh, the first place. And um, there's been quite a bit of work done in the UK on the costs of administration and advocacy and the creation of platforms and infrastructure alongside the APC costs. Because, as you can imagine, if uh, the UK is one of the few countries in the world to adopt a gold uh, OA uh, position, then there are costs involved in actually administering that, which, which uh, we'll see when we look at the costs, are higher for gold than they are for a green landscape, where you're simply, if I can put it like this, depositing in a green uh, OA uh, repository. So it's quite uh, sensible and understandable that the UK should be one of the first countries to actually start looking at the costs of managing and implementing OA as opposed to simply counting the costs of the APCs, how much you uh, pay to the publisher to get your article published as a gold uh, OA um, output in the first place. So here I'm going to look at, uh, at some examples from a number of funders. These are funders that, that UCL you know, uh, receives money from, uh, the Wellcome Trust and Research Council to UK. I've already mentioned we'll look at a little bit more detail about their funding uh, allocations, and then uh, I, I won't go into detail here today, but we also receive a number of uh, funding uh, grants from international funders and European Research Council is, is the gold star in terms of the quality of uh, research funding that is available at an international level. So here I, I'm showing the level of compliance from UCL, from UCL authors will, with the Wellcome Trust mandate. Now the Wellcome Trust is a very generous uh, funder, and uh, there is no limit in practice to the amount of money that the Wellcome will give you to fund gold OA payments. You simply tell them what your projected number of 
uh, welcome funded research articles will be and they will very generously write you a check for that amount of money. But you see here on the table that even when that very, very generous funding regime is in place, you don't get 100% uh, compliance from the authors. So here I, I'm showing levels of compliance on, on the right hand side, the percentage of welcome, um, UCL welcome outputs that appear as uh, OA outputs. And starting in 2009, I'm showing here that the level of compliance was 63%. Uh, uh, even now, in 2013, which is the last full year for which we have um, uh, uh, figures, we're, we're only up to uh, 76%. And that's when uh, all the money is available from the welcome for um, authors to publish as, uh, as, uh, their gold OA output. So here it isn't a uh, lack of money that's the a barrier to 100% compliance. It's, a, it's about engaging with researchers and researchers understanding uh, the welcome requirements compared to, say, the HEFCI requirements, which they're now going to have to comply with, certainly, as part of the research evaluation framework. And, and maybe RCUK as well, if, if another piece of work that they're doing is funded by uh, Research Councils UK. Let's move on and, and look at RCUK policy targets. Uh, uh, we, we've looked at the, at the policy position. Let, let's see what they expect researchers to actually deliver uh, as part of that policy. So RCUK, Research Councils UK, think that this is a, a transition period, We're in a, which is quite right. We are in a transition period from a subscription-based model for journal uh, publication to, we hope, then to our open access enthusiasts and open access uh, environment. Uh, and Research Councils UK see this as a five-year period, starting from 2013. So in year one, the, the first year of the funding from Research Councils UK, they had a 45% requirement. So 45% of the RCUK funded papers that were published in uh, year one uh, had to be uh, OA. Uh, and then, as you can see here from uh, the figures, that percentage rises year on year. So year two, which we're currently in at the moment, uh, the target is 53% of RCUK papers need to be um, Preferably gold OA, because their preference is uh, for gold open access, not, not, not for green. Uh, and by the end of the transition period, okay, but, uh, they, their, their target is only 75%, which funnily enough is pretty close to where we are with the Welcome Trust now. So even at the end of the transition period, RC UK is not projecting 100% uh, compliance with um, uh, their OA requirements, I, I think because they realise, and we all realise, how difficult it is to engage with um, academics and researchers to get them to follow uh, what are, at the end of the day, reasonably simple requirements about uh, 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 deposit. So that's the challenge. The challenge is money. You need money in order to pay the gold OA charge, and these funders are being extremely generous in providing that funding. But even when the funding is available, that the residual challenge is building the platforms and the services and advocating to academics uh, in order to convince them uh, that this is uh, uh, the way, the future for publishing. So here are the results of UCL's uh, compliance over the first two years. So in year one, it was 45% uh, requirement for uh, OA publication for our UK funded papers. So that target for us, UCL was uh, 693 papers. In fact, we managed to exceed that. So we had seven, uh, 797 papers, which represented a, a compliance rate of 115% of the target. So that was fantastic. Um, luckily enough, managed to continue that in year uh, uh, two, the target. So we just finished year two of uh, reporting. Uh, the target was 815 papers. Uh, and we managed to achieve 963, which again represents, um, well, uh, 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 an achievement larger than target, 118% of, of, of target. Many universities, not all universities, were able to exceed the targets. That makes me think that the targets are too generous, and in fact, in, in practice, could be a little bit uh, firmer, because I think we'd still be complying with uh, uh, requirements. 
And here on the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint, I, I won't get because of time, won't go into detail, but these are some of the details from the RCUK report, the review of the first year of the, uh, the implementation of the RCUK uh, uh, policy, uh, showing uh, uh, across the whole of the UK what the level of compliance is. So, for example, the total number of gold publications was 9,297 from, what, 170 universities in the uh, UK. Uh, the total number of green publications was 3,000. 355, so lower than the gold uh, figure because the policy in the, the RCUK policy in the UK is to favour gold rather than green. Green is still eligible for RCUK compliance if you can't meet the gold requirement because the publisher doesn't, uh, for example, the publisher doesn't offer a gold uh, option or the gold option is too expensive, that the APC is too high. So in certain circumstances, green is possible, but you can see that because of the policy position that RCUK has taken, the majority of papers that have been produced and, and, and published as, as OA outputs with RCUK funding are gold in the UK rather than, than green. So that's the level of APC payment, that's what um, we're paying in terms of publishing charges to get uh, the material out there. How much does it cost to maintain your open access infrastructure at university level in order to deliver on those open access policies that we've been, we've been looking at? And here I'm going to use uh, figures from a study which research consulting uh, undertook uh, recently, which was submitted as part of the um, RCUK review of its uh, uh, policy, uh, and I should be honest and say I chaired the uh, editorial committee that produced uh, the policy, although we, we employed an external consultant to write the report, so the report is an independent report, but I, I, I did chair the uh, committee that um, peer-reviewed and, and commented on drafts of the uh, report. And here you, you'll see that in terms of uh, the amount of money that was spent on uh, RCUK um, APC uh, charges, and how much money did RCUK spend on, on, on meeting gold OA charges, the figure there in the report for the, for the first year of implementation was around £11 million. Pounds. So that was on the APC payments. But if you looked at the administration and infrastructure behind it, that universities, and typically in the UK university libraries, what we have to uh, put in place in order to deliver on those OA policies, it was quite a significant figure. So, uh, that they were estimating, based on discussions they had with university libraries, around £9.2 million pounds a year, simply to, make, to implement and develop uh, implementation paths for those um, policies. And the three areas this £9.2 million pounds was typically spent on were infrastructure development, so repository, software, hardware platforms, upgrading of software when new versions of the software came out, advocacy to academics, which I mentioned several times already as a recurring theme in one of the great challenges uh, that are, is facing UK uh, HEIs, uh, UK universities, how to engage with researchers, and then the staffing complement in the library, the management of all these processes. You need staff in order to deliver these Staff need to be paid, so you need to pay wages, and, and that, those are covered in the, in the management costs. Then uh, the, the, uh, the report looked at uh, trying to project um, how much it would cost to implement the REF 2020 uh, open access uh, mandate. So these are extra costs on top of uh, the uh, cost that it's um, estimated for the RCUK policy that I've just described. So the previous set of costs here, whoops, previous set of costs here are simply for the RCC UK policy. Uh, this set of costs is, is then trying to uh, estimate what the cost of implementing the HEFCE REF 2020 uh, open access policy will be. These are our guesses, well, uh, projections, no, reasonably good guesses, uh, based on um, the RCUK spend, because the REF 2020 policy doesn't actually come into force until April 2016. That's when that starts to kick in. So we're now in the preparation phase. But even now, um, the research consulting estimate that the, in terms of implementing the uh, uh, HEFCE uh, uh, re 
requirement. That's going to cost the sector about four to five million pounds. Some of us, myself included, think that's a gross underestimate. And in fact, that figure should be much higher than four to five million. And then the administration costs, as we saw in the um, RCUK implementation. Again, they're estimating about the same level. So another 9.2 million pounds to develop infrastructure advocacy and management. So based on these costs, these actual costs for RCUK and the projections for the HEFKI uh, 2020 OA mandate, the report, the OA research consulting report, managed to work out uh, how much it costs to administer, uh, this, so these are administration costs, how much it costs to administer uh, each article that goes into uh, the OA world. Uh, and they worked out that these are just administration costs, so uh, there are no APC costs in, in, in involved here. These are simply about building infrastructure and doing the advocacy and employing the staff to go out and manage the repository and interact with uh, academics. For every gold OA uh, output, uh, the cost was £81 per article. And for every green OA output, the cost was smaller, but still significant. That's £33 per article. So those are not trivial costs. If you think of how many uh, research outputs you, your university is producing here in UCL, it's about 15,000 um, outputs per year. You can do the sums uh, yourself. You simply multiply uh, 15,000 by each of these unit costs and you come up with quite a scary number for how much it costs to manage OA policy and implementation in your institution. Uh, and my last word uh, in this uh, section on, on administrative costs, how many staff do you need to manage all these uh, outputs and to implement these policies? Well, these are figures taken from the research consulting report. That for every green deposit, uh, sorry, for you need one uh, FDE for every 1,500 green deposits in your repository because that's physically the uh, maximum uh, capacity that each member of staff can uh, work at in terms of managing green deposits. Of course, for gold, and we'll come on to look at the workflow for gold, uh, open access publishing in a minute, the workflow is much more uh, complicated. And here, uh, the research consulting report is suggesting you need an FTE for every 500 APCs. So the implications of that are obvious, if you prefer as the UK does, a gold OA policy to a green OA policy, it's going to cost you more in administrative uh, overheads in order to implement the policy because it, they're more time consuming. Uh, gold OA publishing is simply more time consuming. Okay, let's look quickly at the dreaded issue of double dipping. Countries which favour gold OA, like the UK, have to pay um, for APCs, these article processing charges, but we all also have to pay for the journal uh, uh, subscription. So we're paying, you could theoretically say that we're paying twice, once for the subscription and a second time to make individual articles in a journal available as gold OA articles. And that's called technically hybrid publishing, where a journal has a mixture of non-OA material, to which you simply pay a subscription, and then hybrid material, where, where individual articles have an APC paid in order to make them uh, uh, OA. Uh, of course, you can't. It's unethical to do double dipping, or as some people call it, total cost of uh, ownership. We're looking at the total cost of subscriptions and APCs uh, together. Uh, and just uh, Collections, which is our national negotiating body here in the UK, have produced a set of uh, principles to guide negotiations with publishers so that we do avoid uh, this uh, issue of double dipping or total cost of ownership where there's a danger that universities might be being asked to pay twice for the same uh, elements. And here you see on the uh, screen the second principle in that statement uh, with the URL for the whole statement on the previous uh, slide. Uh, we say that as our second uh, principle, systems should ensure that publishers do not charge the same institutions twice through the payment of subscriptions and the payment of APCs. So that's a principle about how to manage negotiations in this new scholarly communication world. And how do you solve that? How do you avoid 
paying twice for the same material, well, the solution is to implement a series of offsets in your charges. Either you offset the APC against the subscription, so the subscription is lower, or you offset the subscription against the APC, so the unit cost for those APCs is lower. You can do it either way, it depends on the publisher, it depends on what they feel comfortable with, but either you lower the cost of the subscription basically, or you lower the unit cost of the APC to avoid the double charging which would otherwise result if you did absolutely nothing uh, at all. Uh, Just Collections is entering into a number of agreements with publishers uh, to uh, tackle the total cost of ownership, double dipping as it's pejoratively called, and here uh, I give the URL with, to one particular uh, example with, with the publisher Springer, which is a particularly good model and is uh, highly rated by the UK library community because of the flexibility of the model, the offsetting that it introduces and the ability to publish OA in OA as a result of this very uh, far-sighted uh, deal that Springer has struck with the UK academic community through the Drift Collections negotiations. So, in the final part of my talk, I, I, I talked a lot about national position, or indeed a number of national positions, as we don't have one OA uh, uh, policy position in uh, the UK. I've talked about the costs at a national level and some of the challenges in financially in implementing those policies. Let's, in the last five or ten minutes of the talk, look at how these policies have actually been implemented in a bit more detail uh, in uh, UCL. My institution here in central London and how, uh, what the challenges and opportunities are that uh, have occurred to us as, as we've gone through this uh, uh, process here in London. So here we see a list of um, uh, uh, downloads from UCL Discovery, which is the UCL Green uh, Repository. Um, we, we measure them by quarter, so these are quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, with an annual total on the on the right hand side in, in, in the last column. You'll see that when we started measuring in 2010, we had about half a million downloads a year. We thought that was pretty good. Now we're up to 2014, over one and a half million downloads a year, and we're now projecting for 2015, this calendar year, uh, two million downloads a year. So in that uh, five, six year period, uh, a growth from half a million to two million downloads a year for, for the content, the open access content that's in UCR. And I don't see any sign that that uh, trajectory will, will change. I think the, the level of increase in terms of downloads will actually get faster. Because of the REF 2020 policy and the requirement for all the research outputs that are going to be evaluated as part of the research framework uh, to be present in the re uh, repository. Here we're looking at uh, the percentage of uh, material in discovery that is full, uh, full text. Uh, and, the, and the magic figure is here on the, on the right hand side. So when we started measuring in 2011, only around 12% of the uh, material in uh, discovery actually had full text attached. So many of them were metadata only records. Now in, in 2015, we're predicting 28% uh, uh, compliance. So quite a big uh, increase in, 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 in the years under review. Still not good enough, it needs to be 100%. If you had a true national policy that was properly being implemented, that figure wouldn't be 28%, it would be 100%. But you see already the, the impact, I think, of the fund of policies that we have here in the UK that have driven compliance up from 12% to 28%. I think the REF 2020 requirements will uh, certainly drive those figures up even more. We'll get much closer to 100% because REF, the Research Evaluation Framework, is such an important um, development in terms of dictating the amount of research money coming into a university. I spent most of the time talking about commercial publishing. What do you do in terms of open access if you're publishing with an external uh, provider, an external publisher? Well, one thing you can do is to set up your own publishing system. And that's what we've done here in UCL with the UCL Press. So I'm Chief Executive of the UCL uh, Press. It's been launched in summer 2015. Uh, and we will be publishing the whole range of scholarly outputs from journals using OJS, Open Journal System, as a journal publishing platform, 
uh, we're going to publish research monographs, so our first list will have 10 monographs in year one, uh, moving up to 20 in year two. Uh, and we're also going to be publishing textbooks, which is quite unusual, because it's unusual to find digital textbooks that are freely available in a form that uh, makes them open to student free student use. Uh, certainly we do buy e-books here in the library from commercial suppliers, but we find one of the challenges is that the e-books don't often exist in the form that we want them, or in the subject area that we require them, in order to support the UCL curriculum. So if commercial providers aren't providing textbooks in e-format that we can use, we can publish them ourselves, because our authors, our UCL authors, who are writing them themselves, if you have the authors, you can also do the publishing, and that's what UCL Press will do. It will develop a line in open access textbook publishing, because all these outputs, journals, research monographs, and textbooks, are all going to be open access. Uh, UCL Press is born as an open access uh, press. So these are the characteristics of our business model. It is an open access business model. We will plug in a print-on-demand service for those who actually want to have print. Though we expect most users to use digital formats rather than the print version, but there will be an option to buy, for the individual, to buy a print version if that's what they wish. And we'll de be developing technical solutions and innovative interfaces to make open access the default way in which uh, users, particularly students, want to use uh, the material that we are um, uh, producing. And one of the benefits will be it will open up uh, UCL research, these, these 15,000 research outputs that we produce a year. They're all published in this format through UCL Press. Then they will be open to the world of scholarship and to the general public, to anyone, anywhere in the world with an internet connection. So UCL would make a difference to the global challenges that present themselves to society. Uh, disease, poverty, uh, warfare environmental uh, uh, damage. All these areas can be fed by UCL's research and insights if that information is available. And open access publishing through an institutional press is the way uh, to do it. Let's look at one final uh, topic here in uh, the presentation before we try and bring this to a close and draw some general conclusions from the UK uh, position. Uh, I've, I've drawn here, and on the succeeding slides we'll continue to illustrate uh, the workflow that's required by a researcher to go through in order to um, comply with the RCUK requirement, Research Council's UK requirement for a, for a OA output, preferably uh, gold. Uh, and the bits in red in the middle of the diagram, next to the arrows, are decisions that the academic has to make in the workflow before they can make their open access article the goal uh, OA uh, output. Uh, and these decisions um, revolve around copyright, uh, licensing, is the correct sort of license going to be uh, uh, attached, funding, uh, have they approached a funder for uh, funding, can they prove that they're also UK funded so that we can uh, get it we, the library, can claim the funding from the RCUK Publication Fund that we manage. Uh, there are about a dozen decisions that the academic has to make before that article will be made gold away. That's why gold away is so expensive to administer, because there will be a lot of interactions between the academic and the OA team, the open access team here in the library, and the publisher before you get to the end of this uh, workflow here at the bottom, where you get your gold uh, OA output. Gold OA output may be very good for the end user, because they see the benefits of uh, a, a professionally published piece of work as a, a freely available OA output with a CC BY license attached, but it's very expensive and very complicated in terms of the workflow, as you can see through the workflow diagram, for a library and a, a, a researcher to comply with the requirements of, of gold OA uh, funding in order to deliver the output that is the bit that 99% of all users will see, simply the, the output. So if you're following uh, a gold OA policy in your country, you need to be aware that the workflow is complicated uh, and expensive 
uh, and will require a very great level of support from the library, if it's the library who are running the OA implementation in your institution. Uh, all these things will need to be in place in order to deliver the gold OA uh, uh, output. Let me finally, in one final slide, talk about, again, about the importance of advocacy. I think a, a common theme through the uh, talk that I've been giving today is the lack of uh, awareness uh, among some researchers about the requirements and, and what to do, and the level of confusion that exists in their minds about open access. It's the library here in UCL that provides the advocacy for open access. We have an open access team that will go out to departments, will go out to small research groups that will talk to individual researchers in order to deliver an OA uh, solution that the researcher is uh, happy with. Uh, we spend a great deal of time on, on training and the, the, the OAI workshop in Geneva, which is taking place in June 2015. The ninth uh, OAI workshop is the main event in open access in Europe in the year in which, in which it's held, where you can come together with a community of around 300 OA practitioners, mainly based in libraries, who can uh, share experience and uh, can learn from each other in terms of best practice in implementing uh, OA. It's important to include your vice-chancellors in the advocacy uh, activity, not so much to advocate to them, but, but to get them to advocate on your behalf. So coming back to this issue of, of double-dipping, uh, what LERU has done, this is the League of European Research Universities, I talked about the, the evils of, of double-dipping, were it to occur. Well, we've got the vice-chancellors, the vice-chancellors from these 21 research-intensive universities in Europe issued a statement in March this year calling on all stakeholders uh, involved in the negotiation and publishing process to avoid double-dipping uh, and to work together in order to achieve the offsets that I'm suggesting are the solution to the, to the uh, challenge. This is a statement, it's a public statement, it's available on the NERU uh, website and it is already causing a great deal of interest amongst the stakeholders because here is an official endorsement from the European uh, University world that the scholarly communications uh, landscape has to change uh, as we develop OA approaches to a number of uh, publishing uh, challenges. So, in, in conclusion, what have, we, what have we discovered from looking at the UK OA position uh, in 2015? Well, first, the UK doesn't have one policy approach. We have a number of uh, uh, approaches. They don't all agree with each other and they confuse academics on, on the way. Research funders have been largely instrumental in uh, driving the OA um, policy uh, position in the UK because of the level of funding that they're willing to put into gold, uh, OA in particular in the UK, and it is gold OA which is the preferred um, uh, dissemination format for uh, uh, research funders. We've, we've seen that the administrative costs of administering OA, particularly gold OA, are, are not trivial and, and are in, an increasing challenge to universities in times of financial difficulty. It's an increasing challenge for universities to meet these costs and they cannot keep on escalating as uh, they currently are doing as the level of OA take-up uh, in, increases. We need to act on uh, double-dipping as the Leru uh, Vice-Chancellors have shown. And underpinning all this, if you want a successful OA programme institutionally and nationally, you can't do enough advocacy in order to get the points across. I hope this is a useful uh, summary of where we think we are in the UK in 2015 in terms of open access. We have got a very advanced position, probably more advanced than uh, most other countries in uh, Europe. But on the other hand, that's not only a benefit, it brings a whole series of challenges. Uh, I hope I've illustrated some of those opportunities and those challenges uh, in, in, in the talk that you've been listening to. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.